First of all, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out tonight, and um, I hope you enjoy what I have to talk about. It's something that I've been researching for a long time and really kind of getting into over the past year. A lot of it came from Chris and I having discussions about this on a weekly basis, and this is kind of what it's turned into. So tonight I'll be discussing a survey of the contest solos from the Paris Conservatory from 1835 to 1985. And please excuse up front my, my lack of proper French pronunciation. I'm a little better at German. That's what I studied most recently in college, but uh, I'll do my best. So let's carry on in, into our introduction. So since the beginning of 1835, the Conservatoire National Supérieur de Musique de Paris has produced an abundance of studies and solos for trumpet. Aside from Marvin's complete conservatory method, an incredible amount of material has been generated at this institution, and much of it goes generally unnoticed among the trumpet playing population. At the very least, I feel that every serious student of the trumpet should understand these few things. The first is to recognize the significant role that the professors of the trumpet class played throughout development of this trumpet literature. In addition, this brief survey will discuss this broad catalog of trumpet works that developed along with the instrument itself. Many of these solos would be extremely challenging from a technical and musical standpoint. Lastly, the most interesting of the compositions used for educating trumpeters in Paris at this time were those penned for the annual Marco de Concours, an, an, in an internal competition at the conservatory used for testing the skills required for graduation. So in essence, a jury at the end of a semester, how we would look at a jury at the end of a semester. The modern trumpet is a relatively young instrument. Many scholars have discussed the role of the trumpet throughout the history of Western music, and it's an instrument that evolved greatly, receiving not one, but two celebrated eras as a solo instrument. Obviously, a complete summary of trumpet history and literature goes well beyond the scope of this lecture, and you wouldn't want to hear about it anyway. Even in six hours it would take to talk about it. So I've chosen to first discuss some of the major events leading up to the start of the trumpet class at the conservatory, where a culture of innovative trumpet pedagogy and an outpouring of new modern solo works would begin to blossom at the turn of the 20th century. By the contest of 1906, it was clear that the trumpet was beginning to be used more for its melodic capabilities. This was the year that George Inesco composed his work Legend for trumpet and piano. This was an extremely important work that stretched the capabilities of the new orchestral sea trumpet, championed by conservatory professor Marie Francon. Since Francon, successive professors of trumpet at the Paris Conservatory continually lobbied for new contest works from many of the major French composers. Out of this came many new and sometimes very demanding solos. So before we delve deeper into this topic, I would like to talk briefly about the history of the solo trumpet to this point. Since it governed almost everything about the development of the trumpet, I'll start with trumpet design. Changes to the instrument design affected the kinds of music that the trumpet got to play. Up here you see what was called a natural trumpet, a valveless instrument of the Renaissance and Baroque periods. The natural trumpet, as it was called, saw a golden age during the Baroque. The one big problem with this instrument, though, was the lack of available pitches in the low register, essentially forcing players and composers to perform and write mainly in the upper register where there were more available pitches. Due to the nature of the harmonic series, the notes are naturally closer together the higher you play. Even so, in this simpler capacity, the trumpet flourished in Europe as a solo instrument, especially in cities like Leipzig, Bologna, and Vienna. It was in these cities that solos of Johann Sebastian Bach, Giuseppe Torelli, and Henry Purcell became very popular. In contrast, trumpeters in the orchestra remained relegated to an ensemble role. Due to its inability to play chromatically, many major composers at the time, namely Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven, wrote somewhat sparingly for the natural trumpet in their orchestral works. Jumping ahead, we encounter a short rebirth of the trumpet chamber solo occurring late in the 18th century, with two classical concertos composed for Austrian court trumpeter and trumpet virtuoso Anton Weidinger. The concertos of Joseph Haydn in 1796 and Johann Hummel in 1804 were composed for a new type of trumpet, now with added keys similar to those found on a saxophone. This enabled the instrument to play chromatically. The keyed trumpet also allowed an expansion of the instrument's range into the low register. See an example of this here in the opening of Haydn's concerto in E flat. You'll notice in the very beginning, it immediately highlights the low range of the instrument, and there to the bottom of the page, you can see more of the classic writing that would have led up to this point. This early adaptation of the trumpet did not take hold, unfortunately, as its tone left much to be desired, primarily due to its somewhat faulty design. 
John Wallace and Alexander McGrattan mention in their book, The Trumpet, that in the concertos of Haydn and Hummel, the solo trumpet took the leap forward conceptually, but this concept was ahead of its time, because we didn't really have an instrument that worked very well yet. So in general, the remainder of the classical beginning of the Romantic periods saw little in the way of new music for the solo trumpet. Changes in instrument design, the indecision between crooks and valves, and the eventual replacement of com reluctance of composers to write for the inferior piston trumpet are primary factors for this phenomenon. So what's so cool about the valve? Well, I'm going to tell you. It was the eventual refinement of the valve in the mid-19th century that would change the trajectory of the trumpet forever. The valve mechanism itself went through many design changes between 1820 and 1840. Ultimately, the Perronet piston valve invented and patented by, you know, Francois Perronet in 1838 and in 1839 would prove to be the most successful. And this design would continue for years leading up to the valve that we have now on our piston trumpets. Now the trumpet had fully chromatic capabilities that would eventually lead to better solo material and an abundance of studies that really exploded with the acceptance of the C and B flat trumpet in the orchestra and later at the conservatory. This also added a new element for those of us you know, who play trumpet of things to practice, finger dexterity. So switching gears a little bit, we're going to talk a little bit about the Concours de Prix. Historically, there's been little written about this uniquely French tradition, with most information found in a few scholarly papers. I've referenced several of these in preparation for this lecture, the main one being by Frank Romero, um, a dissertation basically covering all of the history of what I'm talking about today in very, very great detail. After completing studies at the conservatory, the remainder of the student's term was dedicated to mastering their instrument. The annual competition known as the Cours de Prix, Concours de Prix, has students competing for the top prize, the Premier Prix. Traditionally, a solo was commissioned for this contest, this being the, the Morco de Concours. The first of these contests was held in October 1797. Originally, prizes were given, and now only the prestige of winning is the prize. The goal of first place would ensure students' success in his or her music career. Other levels of recognition included second place, first honorable mention, and second honorable mention. The professor at the time would submit three compositions to the director of the conservatory, and he would select one of them for the contest. The competition was held each June, and it would be expanded to include a contrasting solo, a mix of traditional and modern styles, and later a second contest would be added in the fall, which is very close again to our jury system at the end of the fall and spring semester. So again, the purpose of this lecture is to provide a survey of some of the many great contest works, contest works composed between 1835 and 1985. This was a fruitful period for original trumpet writing at the conservatory, and it gives me a nice number to work with, 150 years. Also, Beginning in the late 1980s, few new solos were composed, and records indicate several years that had no contest. So I found 1985 is a good place to stop, at least in what I want to talk about today. These solos are also important as they clearly show the shifting trends and attitudes of teachers and composers towards the trumpet during this large time of growth. From a pedagogical standpoint, the clear influence of the professors at the time linked these solos to the skills required of the students in their studios. As the trumpet continued to resemble its present-day counterpart, the music study at the conservatory reflected the improvements in instrument design, and composers, composers little by little began to push the limits of both the capabilities of the instrument and of the performers themselves. Since an abundance of music was written for the concours, these works are essentially a genre within themselves. Nowhere else in Europe was music being written for the solo trumpet, especially, and this is outside of the opera or symphony orchestra, at such a rate. As the design of the trumpet improved, these contest works, as I mentioned, became increasingly difficult, especially with regard to technique, range, and endurance. Many have not been recorded, either because of their inaccessibility, as a lot of them are still found in libraries throughout Paris, and, uh, or their extreme difficulty, as you will see when I show you some of the examples in a bit. So let me take you back to where it all began in Paris. And now we have valves on a trumpet, <clears throat> so the trumpet and the keys of F and G of the 19th century were used in the early orchestra trumpet section and for some of Daverney's earliest solos. Crooks were utilized to change key, as was the practice with the natural trumpet. Mm -hmm. 
Naturally, players accustomed to the natural trumpet already had a firm grasp on tonguing, flexibility, and accuracy, and especially in the upper register where they spent most of their time. Generally, there was a fair amount of opposition to this early orchestral instrument by the society of musicians and composers in Europe. Many still favored the natural instrument for its pure tone. Regardless, the F trumpet with three valves was brought from Paris to Berlin in 1826, and Francois Davernay, the first trumpet teacher at the Paris Conservatory, quickly realized the enormous possibilities of the instrument. So Davernay would eventually have a trumpet made by a, a gentleman by the name of Antoine Halleray that ended up with two valves instead of three, and went on to write several early method books for the valve trumpet, according to Edward Tarr, trumpet historian. A majority of Davernay's compositions early on, including the one that I'll be playing later, was written for both the cavalry trumpet, or the trumpet d'ordonnance, which looks like a bugle pretty much, and the two-valve trumpet in F. I was very excited. Generally, generally Domernay was restricted by the acceptance of the piston valve. It just took a while for people to come around and accept this as like the new thing that was happening with as far as the trumpet was concerned. From 1840 to 1891, the valve trumpet was used in the orchestra alongside the natural trumpet in G with crooks to change keys all the way down to B flat. So that's a lot of crooks. In 1857, Dauberday revised his method for the trumpet, which, could, which covered a complete history of the instrument from antiquity all the way up to that present time, and was still mostly a method for natural trumpet. He spent a lot of time talking about articulation, which I'll mention later as well, and that was one of the other big things in this method. Also in the method, he provides exercises on the seventh partial B flat, and places much emphasis on high range development as well. And as you can see here, the, the three notes that are in black here are the ones that are most difficult to tune on the natural trumpet because they don't really lock in as the others do in, in the series. So this is why these early teachers were really focusing on that note. However, there's a section on chromatic trumpets in his method, even this early on, explaining the construction and, and use of valves, chromatic tones, scales, and trills. In Paris, the slide trumpet of English origin took a close second to the natural trumpet. The slide trumpet had four positions and provided access to more chromatic notes than the natural uh, ones that just had crooks which you would insert. At this point, I feel that it's important to add just a little bit more on the early working trumpeters in France during this transitional time. Along with Davernay, two other prominent trumpeters from the mid-19th century must be noted. Brian Prosh, a, actually a former classmate of mine, in his article, Buell Davernay Cresser and the Trumpet in Paris, from 1800 to 1840, interestingly notes that during the first 50 years of Davernay's life, he was highly innovative, yet fraught with professional failure. He was not the best trumpet player at that time, regardless of the fact that he was the first professor at the conservatory. And all the while he lived in the shadow of his more famous uncle, Joseph Buell. Joseph Buell was regarded as the most respected trumpeter of his era. He contributed greatly to military music and standardized tempos for military calls. Buell also wrote many solo calls and multi-trumpet fanfares with an obvious focus, again, on articulation. He continued to write the trumpet method in 1825, and after 1829, he helped to design both the military trumpet and slide trumpet in 1832 and 1833, respectively. So a lot of stuff was kind of going on at this time with people figuring things out. Joseph Presser played the trumpet in many prestigious ensembles and penned two methods, one for stopped natural trumpet and one for valved cornet. He worked at the Académie Royale de Musique, today the Paris Opera, during the 1830s, and his method focused on accuracy and intonation, in addition to development of the upper partials. Kresser also played special emphasis on strengthening the accuracy of the seventh partial, B flat, with providing exercises in G minor. Very interesting. What does all of this mean for Davernay? Well, these two individuals were important to know because Davernay performed next to them in many ensembles over the span of 30 years. After the introduction of the German Stozel valve, Davernay tried to capitalize on the design by designing his two-valve trumpet, which pleased the French and irritated the Germans, because he essentially was stealing some of their hard, you know, discovered uh, technology at the time. They felt he was plagiarizing an outdated German design. Unfortunately, or unfortunately for Davernay, he had to deal with that, but it also made him into a name. It was his way, it was his way of kind of getting his name at the top of the list of just influential trumpet, trumpeters at that time. So ultimately, he made a name for himself, and with the help of his uncle, he attained a level of prominence that led to his appointment as professor of trumpet at the Paris Conservatory. From a pedagogy standpoint, 
Daverney combined the styles and ideas of both Buell and Kessler in his ever-evolving trumpet method, emphasizing articulation, tone production, and accuracy. So that more or less covers the historical bits um, that I felt were necessary to get us to this point. As far as talking about these solos, the solos are very important, as we will get to, but the second most important thing were the professors who facilitated the writing of them. So I'd like to briefly kind of go through some of the important points of, of these professors. So Francois d'Avernay was influenced by Johann Altenburg, who was a German trumpeter in the late 1700s. In 1827, he was the first to use the new F three-valve trumpet in public performance, remember it was brought to him from Germany, and was among the first to realize its potential. He's credited with persuading several composers to write for it, including Berlioz in his Waverly Overture of 1827 and Rossini in his William Tell of 1829. In 1833, he became the first trumpet teacher, as I mentioned at the conservatory, teaching both valve trumpet and natural trumpet, which I mentioned that he also talks about in his method. His most famous student was Jean-Baptiste Arvin, famous for his cornet skills and pedagogy. And he would retire from teaching there in 1859. Also important to note, as I said, that he was a working trumpeter. He was out on the scene, and he had colleagues who helped him professionally along the way. This is an example of one of the um, quartets that Dauberne would have written for his students. And you can see all the different key trumpets on the side, which would be all the different crooks that they would use in, to, to play um, in different keys. You can also see the style as well, very military in style, arpeggios on the bottom. You're going to notice um, later on, even when we get into his solo that I, that I play, he's very particular about these trumpet gestures that he uses and with articulation, and a lot of this will just pop up later. Cirque was Lesser known, he was the successor to Daverney, and there's just not a lot about his life. He really didn't do much either. He was kind of like, you know, an in-between person. Um, the trumpet studio was really very stagnant when he was there. Not a lot was happening. He also was, was faced with several challenges. The cornet class started in 1869, and he was really overshadowed by that because of the popularity. And I'm sure those of you here who aren't trumpeters will still know what the Arvin book is, because it's a huge name in our history, probably the biggest. He did, com he did compose a few works for the contest. And he also, like Daverney, composed some marches, things along the military lines, and was professor from 1869 to 1894. Perhaps the most influential of any of the professors at the Paris Conservatory was Marie Franco. Marie Francon wrote a method book that basically finally taught everyone how to play the trumpet, how to warm up, and how to do everything. And the book basically, it looks just like this. This is the real book. So it kind of looks like the Arvin's book. And if you were to leaf through it, it has very, very similar um, exercises. And the end is the most interesting, because it um, has sections of the contest solos that he was getting his students to work on. So all the ones that were being played during his tenure, he had in the back of the book for study. So he took his job very seriously, and he set out to really popularize the trumpet. So he wrote the first real complete method for trumpet, for orchestral trumpet as, as we know it. He worked to legitimize the studio and promote the trumpet as much as he could. He commissioned 19 solos by 17 composers over 31 years. During his tenure, the trumpet made a comeback. The C trumpet became widely accepted in the orchestra and at the conservatory, and he even went as far as to experiment with four and five valve C trumpets. So it was known as the trumpet moderne, piston trumpet in C. It was developed, development was began in the 1850s. It made its way into the opera in 1874. It was not generally accepted into the conservatory until later. It was actually during Francon's tenure where it was really used for these solos and kind of practically like taught as well. The four and five valve trumpet is kind of interesting because it was used at the conservatory between 1917 and 1920, and Roger Voisin, who's edited and done a lot of stuff with our music, um, actually brought it to the States in 1956 and played it um, in Boston for a, a bit of time. 
The most uh, important thing, I think, about his method was his focus on warming up. And this is a section from the beginning of his book talking about what he called emissions. And they were just basically soft attacks that you would do every day. And Maurice Andre and Hocan Hardenberger swear by this as being like very, very crucial in their development, along with the rest of the book. But this is some of the stuff that really was very, very new from whatever came before. So a little bit more about Frank Kahn later when we get into the repertoire. Um, but just know that with him at the helm, the newly commissioned solos continue to add more and more technical challenges, and they also begin to prop, prop, prop up in some unexpected forms, some different forms than before. Um, very technical one-movement concertinos, short pieces, um, very few concertos and things like that. But these one-movement, very compact musical things were what he was really into at the time. The teaching materials constructed by Frank Kahn helped students build a strong fundamental foundation much like Arben did for the cornet, leading to successful execution of many of these demanding solos. Eugene Fauveau was a student of Marie Francon, and he taught cornet first, and the trumpet was added to his studio in 1941. He was a virtuoso cornet player, and he did a lot of editing, as many of these the, the professors after Francon would do. Composers would write etude studies uh, anything, and different solos, the contest solos, and the composers would edit them um, along with the, co with the uh, composers. The teachers would edit them along with the composers. He favored Claudemir's uh, studies and edited those as well. He found an interest in orchestral excerpts and tried to push that a little bit, something that really wasn't in the studio up until this point. He edited the last studies of Brandt, which is very orchestral in nature, and he commissioned many works, him along with the next gentleman, Sadri, uh, commissioned many, many, many works, and especially in the 40s and 50s. And he was professor from 1925 to 1955. And again, his successor, and they actually overlapped because he was a student of his, um, was Raymond Savarish. He was a student of Fauveau, and he taught uh, also both cornet and trumpet. And it's important to note that really from this point on, they all taught cornet and trumpet together. So all of these teachers taught both instruments. And it's interesting to note that because if you go back in history, they were both very separate instruments for a long time. And all of a sudden, they're kind of taught together, and they also share a lot of the same solos, which I'll talk a little about later as well. One of the coolest things about Savarish is that he started what he called class teaching. And what class teaching was is, instead of having, he, you would have one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one lessons. And also, you would be taught by the professor in front of your peers. It was a very cutthroat and um, competi very high competition at the Paris Conservatory in these days. And when Maurice Andre was there at this time, he talks about that, how he, it would just be like, everyone was trying to outdo the next person. So this master class setting maybe wasn't the greatest, you know, thing for people's nerves, but it was something I think that led to what we view as our master classes today. So following Savarish is his student, Maurice Andre, who I'm sure most of, in this, most of us in this room know. He continued this idea of class teaching or master classes with his students. And he was, of course, a prize-winning solo artist and orchestral musician and professor from 1967 to 1979. And following him was probably the next big name. The guys who are there now aren't as known. This tradition also isn't as popular as it was back then either. But Pierre Thibault was most famously teacher for Hocan Hardenberg and, and Reinhold Friedrich, two of our big recitalists that are still around today. And he was also an international soloist and orchestral musician. He taught trumpet and cornet, and he had a very wide repertoire and was very interested in new music and had a very strong working relationship with Pierre Boulez. He was professor from 1975 until 1994. So stylistic changes and requirements mandated by the conservatory's directors and professors have which had changed the way the contests were implemented throughout their history. It changed. When different directors came in, different teachers were there, the style of the music was different, and what was required of the students for their, these juries once or twice a year was also ever-changing, ever-evolving. So now let's get into the music a little bit. All of these pieces have basically two sides to them. They have a tender, lyrical, romantic side, and they also have a very military, heroic, and very traditional trumpet side. And I, mentioned, I keep mentioning this idea of trumpet gestures and these, these trademark trumpet rhythms and articulations that were started by Dauvernay, and you can basically trace them, as you'll see, through the whole history of, of trumpet repertoire in France at this time. Also, 
very, very quickly, there was a huge divide between the earlier and later solos in regard to range, technique required, fingering ability, like finger ability, finger dexterity, and most important, endurance. Some of these, I don't know how many students at the time even got, I, I would assume they wouldn't even have played some of these pieces in their full uh, length because they're just unbelievably demanding. So in most cases, all these things that, these trumpet gestures, all this style, technique, endurance, etc., was what they were testing at the end of, of the year or the semester with these contest solos. And sometimes these pieces, as you will see, were exceptionally written and incredibly musical. And I hope that the few that I play for you tonight, you'll be able to get a little grasp of that. So, the first piece that I'm going to be playing for you tonight, and I just wanted to put these up so you can kind of just have a look at what I'm talking about from a style standpoint. This is Daugherty's theme and variations. And it would have been played most likely on this low F trumpet, or F trumpet, um, that was used in the orchestra, one of the very first instruments. This actually may have also been played on the two valve, because there's not, if you notice, there's not a lot of low notes, and things get a little bit closer together as you get higher, because the two valves was still sacrificing the low register. And that was really because nobody liked the sound of that back then. They wanted, they were used to the natural trumpet upper register sound and purity. So Daugherty really quickly uh, composed in two forms, theme and variation like this, and he also composed fantasies, which were a little more um, adept to melodic development and some diff a little bit more interesting and less rigid of a form than this. Um, most of them were in the bravura style, the fanfare style, and a lot of that existed more than the, lyr than the lyrical passages at this point. The early solos reflected the trumpet's use as an orchestral harmonic instrument. And there's very specific instructions, as you can see on here, for articulation and phrasing. Um, there's like a few different, uh, there's staccatos under a phrase mark, there are several different kinds of accents, and when I play it, um, I'm gonna try to make a little bit different so that you can understand where he was going with the different, and the different styles of articulation, the stress that they really placed on it back then. So this was used for the Concours in 1842 and 1854. It's in the key of B flat, transcribed for B flat trumpet. It starts with an andante cantabile introduction, lyrical with specific articulations. The intro continues into a triple tonguing section in a more military style with a focus on articulation. There's a short cadenza followed by a bolero theme. Again, this fanfare bravura style. A variation one that's staccato and leggero with technical triplet figures. A variation two, which is also the finale, features double tonguing accents, syncopation, and a coda, double triple tonguing accents, and fanfare military style again. This is one of the many great solos that Daugherty composed between 1835 and 1893. Here's a little shot at the end so you can see the continued development of the variations and the coda.
just want to like talk really briefly about a few of the bigger pieces. This is a piece by Al Ray called Morco de Concours, and it was uh, one of the early solos for sea trumpet. It was used in 1900 and 1925. Interestingly, it's in the key of D flat. Crazy. Very different from anything that came before. And it opens with a really dramatic use of fifths and octaves. There's a piano section with chromaticism that builds to an opening theme. An allegro section in B flat with fanfare triplets, followed by a short cantabile section in the middle. It's fairly short in length, with a range that regularly spans two octaves. Note the trumpet gestures that we've been seeing all along, and similar to what I just played, even though this comes much later. And Frank Hahn was professor during this time, and the next few solos are going to be when he was there, so you get an idea of what he was expecting of the students. The next one is one that, that's as familiar to us as trumpeters, and it's the row parts on Dante and Allegro. And the slow and later fast movement setup was came to be like a very, very, very important um, form for these solos. Uh, whether it was in Dante and Scherzo, or Dante and Allegro, Lento and Scherzo, things like that, it was always this slow, fast, and then usually with a return of the slow maybe at the end. Um, this was used in 1903 and 1916. It begins with an andante lyrical melody and an allegro that begins forte in a different style, but quickly moves back to the more lyrical feel. And it happens to have a darker tone to it than a lot of the other solos at this time. And after this, another typical triplet section, changing keys ends in an allegro, and a recap of all the themes and coda brings everything to the end. And it's very a really quick recap of all the opening themes kind of shoved in the second half of that page, and you can see that. So it's fairly short, range is not too extreme, it was pretty accessible, I'm sure, to most trumpeters at the time. This is not the best copy of this, but hopefully you get the idea. This was um, another one of the very early sea trumpet solos, and it came right before the Inesco legend, which I'm going to talk about next. And that is like the hallmark solo of any of them, for lots of reasons. But this one was played a lot as well in 1905, 1917, 1924, 1930, and 1945. And there was a lot of good music written during that time, and this one was kind of used a lot in between a lot of other pieces. Um, it has a fanfare style, lots of staccato, um, really needs to, to be an accurate player. Again, this focus on accuracy is important. Rapidly changing dynamics, triple tonguing, showcasing technical ability now, almost regularly. And Frank Hahn used this three times when he was teaching there, and of course twice after he, he left. Okay, the next solo that I'm gonna talk about, and then we're gonna play from here, is the UNESCO legend. And it was used in 1906 first, 1908, and 1921. And what made this so much different than, all, than the C, it wasn't the first piece for C trumpet, but it was the first piece for C trumpet that made it do things that nobody thought it could do. So from a musical standpoint, it was just, I mean, nothing before this has the, the power of all this music crammed into a six minute piece as this one does. So it kind of really came out of left field, and it really helped Frank Kahn's whole thing about, you know, go trumpet. It was very helpful for that. And, and this is one of our most popular solos, and if you go back and look at previous programs of recitals over the last 15 years, this is probably, I think, the most played, it is the most played, of any of the, the contest solos that we have. And there's quite a few of them. So it's in an impressionist style, uh, kind of like Foire, Massenet, it reflects evolution of the trumpet, marks a major change in style. Now it shows that the C trumpet is a fully chromatic instrument. And it, interestingly too, the part is just labeled for trumpet and piano, not for trumpet and C or B flat, for trumpet and piano. And I think that was kind of Inesco's way of helping Frank Hahn as well by being like, yeah, you know, the trumpet, the C trumpet, it's, it's like the thing now. So that's what, I think that's a lot of the reason why it wasn't really specified. Um, it goes from low A flat to high C, very large range. It's in the key of C minor generally. It has a lyrical melody in the beginning, middle, and end, with technical passages in between, with diff difficult fingering and um, a focus on triple tonguing, but pianissimo, or piano and mezzo piano triple tonguing, something that's not as easy to do, especially in the higher registers. So it's has very complimentary piano accompaniment, and there's very um, specific words that he uses to kind of dictate style in this, something also really wasn't used to such an extreme in solos before this.
So, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more, and then I'm going to play one more piece, and then we're going to finish up, so we're getting close to the end. This is good. Um, just to quickly go through, I'm going to just talk about some pieces that I had in my possession that I kind of used to, to figure out what I wanted to play and what I wanted to talk about. I'm just going to go through them really quick and just give you general characteristics, and you can kind of start to see the similarity in everything. Uh, theme and variations, of course, this is on a, a, a known melody at the time. But pretty soon into it, you start to see, you know, pretty technical writing. Um, and it would stay like this for the rest of the piece for the most part. Again, here's another slow, fast type of, and this is one that's very, um, this is when Foubeau started teaching there. So this would have been, um, he was very into cornet, remember, first, because he taught trumpet later. So a lot of the stuff at the very beginning of his tenure kind of looked like this because it's very cornet influenced. Um, just as the, actually no, okay. So that's about that, the cornet, the cornet influence. And you'll start to see that as well in the later pieces. And now you start to see a mixture of trumpet and cornet types of stuff. If you were to look at the cornet solo, which I'm really not getting into at all, you would notice very similar types of things in the Arvin's book. And again, this is the trumpet gestures, triplets. Now we're involving double tonguing as well. Bozo was a major contributor to the trumpet repertoire. And most students have had contact with at least one of his solos, I think, especially college students. He's known for his technical writing, especially in his chamber music. Anybody who's played his quintet would know that, his brass quintet. Um, he was a student of the Paris Conservatory. He won the Prix de Rome, the composing competition, in 1934. And amazingly enough, this was the first piece he ever wrote for trumpet. <laughs> so it's a pretty awesome, you know, uh, first try out of the gate. C trumpet, so it's pretty good. Also very interesting to note that if you were to play this, the, and the, the general vibe of the piece is quite declamatory, and if you think about the time when this was written, 1943, things in Paris were not very good. So it would be very interesting to know what, his, what was going on in his world while he was writing kind of such a powerful piece. I don't know if, if it has anything to do with, with the war at the time or not, but maybe something to research in the future. André Jolivet wrote a concertino in 1948. He also wrote two concertos for trumpet that were not contest pieces. He had an interest in atonality. He liked chromatic writing, very angular. And note the craziness of the range in the very beginning of this piece. Already by the sixth line, you're already playing high Cs. So he doesn't waste much time to kind of get you doing crazy things. This was also a time when both Fouveau and Savaric were teaching at the same time. So there's a lot of commissioning, I'm sure, by both of them, and they had a lot of friends, and lots of pieces were written for them. Things were really kind of thriving at that point. Here's another one from during that time, 1950. Again, a the theme and variation style, and if anybody saw any of, of Biche's uh, etude books, very similar in style to what you get there as well. He uh, took this from one of the more than 500 one-movement keyboard sonatas by Scarlatti, a Baroque composer. And it's in the cornet style, theme and variations, and he was a professor of counterpoint, so it's very interesting. He would take, actually the, the theme of variations is interesting in this because he would take little fragments of earlier bits and make them into a new theme later, as I kind of had marked when I was learning this a few years back. Here would be the other variations. He wrote a Capriccio as well in 1952. It's a lesser known piece, I can see why, because it's extremely difficult for B-flat trumpet or cornet, and there's almost no rest, so maybe this was written for Savarish himself to play, I don't know. But <laughs> I don't know how many students would have enjoyed um, trying to learn this thing, I wouldn't, that's for sure. Uh, and the next one is, is probably, and in my notes when I was kind of going through these, I just have in capital letters, why? Like, why would you write, this is, so this piece is called, I apologize for being cut off, it's um, Fanfare to Spring, and it's kind of a mix of everything. There's jazz influence, the the, a later section, you can't see it on here, but it's marked blues at the top in a wonderful key. And it's also written for cornet and A, which makes it doubly difficult. And here's a little bit of the ending, just so you can have a look. I mean, it just kind of covers every single angle of what you would have to know as a trumpet player, period. So, very interesting to see. The Boats of Rustiques was his fifth piece that he wrote. And this is, uh, really utilizes these cadenza-like passages that composers started to like to use in the in the 50s and 60s. Also, this is much like the Caprice was declamatory a lot in, in nature, um, you know, opening type of fanfare, free uh, 
playing and uh, quickly getting into some technical stuff and then getting into some lyrical stuff there at the bottom of the page. Okay, the last piece I'm going to play for you and talk about briefly is the Charles Shane's Concerto. One of the few concertos, as I mentioned, written for this contest. They were mostly one movement pieces. So this, um, I also read though that uh, when they did a concerto for this, they typically only did one movement because of the length, of, especially some of, um, some of the longer pieces. If it was a longer piece, they would just do one or two movements. So tonight I'm going to play two movements for you. I'm going to start with the second slow movement and then play the first movement after that. Um, Shanes was a student of Mio and Rivier and won the Grand Prix de Rome in 1951. He has a generally atonal style, chromatic style as well, but not a strict use of surrealism. He opens with a diminished statement in the first movement, which you'll hear, and a lot of uh, interaction between the orchestra and the trumpet, or the piano and the trumpet in my case today. He has a very playful allegro section that's muted, again, with a lot of interaction with the trumpet. And he takes this allegro theme and transforms it a lot for the rest of the movement. He introduces a brand new lyrical melody in the middle of the first movement with cut mute, which kind of really like changes the feel almost immediately. And then it goes back to the main theme in a new key with a large cadenza and an orchestral ending. The trumpet does not end the first movement. Um, the second movement, or yeah, the second movement is marked adagio, and it's basically espressivo the entire time, a little bit more room to uh, interpret some things. Uh, again, like the, the French composers tended to overwrite every, like they told you how to do everything. So anytime you have a solo where you can like do a little bit of your own expression adding is always a nice thing. So, and also the, the, the slow tempo of the second movement by itself makes it very demanding, and you'll see why when I, when I play it. Um, and the third movement is, again, back in the technical realm um, with thematic material from the first movement. And at this point, this solo this year was used for both the trumpet and cornet contest. So this is like, I, I thought this is, first of all, this covers a lot of the techniques kind of all in one that I've been talking about. And also it's a time when the cornet and trumpet were truly viewed as pretty equal because they were playing the same thing for the jury. So it's pretty, pretty cool in that respect. Okay, so really quickly, and, and just to kind of do this a little more of a flow, I'm going to finish talking about everything that I was going to talk about after I played, and I'm just going to end with the playing. I think that will be a little more effective. And then I'll have to come back up here again. <laughs> this, I actually, you can't see the title of this, but I included it because it's called Trumpledor. And I don't even know anything about the piece. Roger Butchu actually um, played one of his quintets uh, this semester, and so it's, he's a very chromatic writer along the lines of Jolivet and the same kind of thing. Um, but I just thought the name Trumpledore was like the funniest thing I did. I wish I could see it. It's there, though, I promise. It says that. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a very large mixture of styles, and this was used in 1962. This piece, the Weber Strophes in 1966, utilizes string orchestra and percussion. And this is like one of the solos that really marked a definite change in style from the kind of conventional formulas that were used up until now. Maurice Andre had taken over pretty much at this time. Um, the beginning is atonal with some meter changes, varied rhythms, challenging melodic line, full of articulations and, and just crazy cross rhythms and changes of meter and things like that. So this was definitely a, a time when things really, this was one of the solos that really shifted gears to the modern or kind of last stage of these, of these solos. So from here on out, you'll start to see like Rhythm being used more, chromaticism being used a lot more. This is a piece, actually I didn't realize there were any written for piccolo trumpet, but this is the only solo that was written for piccolo trumpet for the contest in 1973. And this modern style of composition was carried from into the 1970s and 1980s. This would be a, a page of some of them, some of the uh, more atonal and extended technique pieces, kind of explaining in a few different languages the notation. And this is a solo from 1982 which is unaccompanied, one of the few trumpet solos that was unaccompanied at the time. This is a shot of the first, I think, third page, just to give you an idea of the different things that she used. And finally, as we get later and later, um, percussion was mixed a lot with, with these trumpet solos. And this was one that I dug up that was in um, the library at Yale and this is the first page of it, and it's very long. I think it's 10 minutes or so. 
And um, it features trumpet in B flat and a lot of varied percussion. Basically every movement, I think it's four or five movements, and every movement changes the percussion accompaniment of the trumpet. So this is kind of where everything led to. And then after that, you know, it, there's been, there was, a, like I mentioned in the beginning, there was a rotation of solos. So a lot of the commissions stopped, like, like, a lot of, like a lot of other places, there were financial difficulties here and there. And so eventually the students would just choose from a list of standard repertoire from year to year on what they would play. And I would assume that many of these solos weren't included. But the ones that I, the more popular ones that I talked about most definitely were, I'm sure, included from year to year. So if I could sum up in one word, I was thinking of one word like to talk about, to, discuss, to describe all of these pieces. And I would just say, the ultimate use of drama. I mean, it's a very dramatic trumpet writing in every sense of the word. Um, it made students and everyone excited about the trumpet. And that was the coolest thing about it. Like, it, through all this music, it really put the trumpet up with other instruments that have been doing this kind of solo work all along. So my hope is that you know, some of these solos get played more and other composers and trumpeters are influenced by them. And in turn, you know, new trumpet works along the lines of the really good ones that came out of here, hopefully will start to emerge regularly or continue to emerge regularly. So I hope you enjoyed my talk on French trumpet solos and we'll finish up with uh, the second and first movement of the Shane's Concerto.